Uh, today is part two of our session with uh, Kent Summers. Uh, Kent Summers founded and successfully exited three startups over a 16 year period. Uh, Kent teaches the B2B sales for startups IAP course at MIT and is a visiting lecturer at HBS. Kent is an executive leadership coach in the Harvard Advanced Leadership Initiative, is on the teaching faculty of Thai Boston and the mastering sales program at Northwestern's Kellogg School. And he serves on the boards of Sigma Labs, a NASDAQ company, uh, as well as mater uh, Mass Materials Tech and IQ3 Connect. Thank you everyone for joining us and the great feedback uh, that we got from last session and uh, hand it over to Kent. Uh, hello everyone, I'm uh, glad to be back with you. Uh, we covered a lot of ground in a short period of time last Tuesday. Um, today's gonna be the same deal. I'm gonna try to cover as much ground as I can an hour with you so you you walk away with something that's, um, that's helpful. Um, last session, um, we focused on uh, sales tools and mechanics, the profile, working the pipeline, the different stages of sales and do's and don'ts and um, best practices for uh, working a pipeline. Um, this afternoon, I'm gonna shift uh, the discussion a little bit. Um, I want to cover um, a couple topics uh, that are usually uh, challenging to a lot of early stage companies. Uh, sales forecasting and understanding your sales uh, economics. And then what I want to do is um, uh, follow up or wrap up with uh, offering you some effective methods uh, to help prospects uh, opt in or opt out of your sales process. As you may recall, on Tuesday, we talked about the different types of salespeople's attitudes and behavior where uh, the most uh, matured uh, sales uh, skills is what's called the sales facilitator. So I wanted to share some of those sales uh, facilitator uh, skills uh, with you this afternoon. And hopefully if there's um, time at the end here, I've got a hard stop at uh, 210, we can make some room for some Q&A. If you have other questions, just pop them to Joe via chat. You can interrupt me as we, uh, we go through. So um, I learned sales. Uh, I never went to business school. Um, I learned sales through failure. Um, many, many years of failure. So I like to, um, I like to offer um, sales techniques in the context of a failed uh, case, mini case study here. So uh, with that, I'm going to start out today's session with a, a sales fail here and explain to you why it failed. All right, so you're the founder uh, of a two-year-old VC-backed startup. Your product sells for a fixed price of 50k. You've been actively selling now for 9-12 months, building your pipeline so far. You know, congratulations, you landed three customers. So you've taken in, you've booked 150k in revenue. Um, you've got five well-qualified opportunities in your pipeline. They look exactly like the three that you just closed. You're not so much, you're not so sure about timing, um, but they're very well-qualified opportunities. And you have a board meeting with your investors next week to assess your financing needs. And uh, they sent you a note um, uh, and they want, as part of this meeting, they want to understand the value of your pipeline and how much money do you expect to close this month and this quarter? Now, these are very typical questions uh, of an investor, especially uh, when you're being drip fed uh, by investors at the early stage. Uh, so you have, to, you have to figure out a way to um, answer these very important questions. Um, I can tell you this, that um, all of us <clears throat> have a difficulty making uh, predictions here. It's always a very hard and challenging uh, thing to do here. And it turns out that there's quite a few methods available for people to forecast sales. Um, a lot of them are in, inexact uh, for one reason or another. There's not just one method out there that's reliable. A um, couple of the popular methods out there, um, you've got the, uh, the optimist, um, you know, 
They feel very, very good uh, about their confidence in closing business and they take an optimistic view of their business and their pipeline. I can share with you personally that as a founder, um, optimism has never served me well as a founder. And of course, the uh, uh, flip side of that is uh, Sandy the sandbagger, you know, somebody that uh, is pretty good at managing people's expectations and living, uh, leaving him or her the opportunity to outperform those, those expectations. Those are several popular methods. And what I'd like to do is offer you a method that um, I've developed and used in the past for myself and for lots of companies that I work with that tends to work very well uh, because it's not only reliable, it's very simple. So it's called the weighted pipeline. And this is a way of measuring the relative value of your pipeline versus the absolute value. Now let's take the example of that 50K fixed offering here in the context of the different stages of my sales process. Um, I would ascribe a 25% um, likelihood of close if I'm at the buyer interest stage versus a 40% likelihood of close if the timing is known and I've established uh, I built a business case in the buyer interest and 60% and so on. Um, so basically all you do is you multiply these weightings times the value of the offering and that gives you the weighted value. So it's very, very simple. So my question is, where do these weighting percentages come from? Are these things that you just made up or so forth? Uh, if you can just, um, uh, chat where you think these um, these weightings come uh, came from, and I'll give you a clue. I covered them in Tuesday's uh, session. Does anybody have an idea where these weighting percentages come from? Do you just make them up, or anybody have any thoughts on that? Bingo. Saju, the conversion rate. Bingo. So it does come from the sales funnel, but it is the conversion rate in the sales funnel. That's exactly right. These are the conversions percentages between the different stages of your sale. So you can see here, and I'm not sure where this um, markup is coming from. That's interesting. Um, it's not me. Can you see the markup, Joe? This yeah, I can, I, can, I can see it. It must be one of the participants. Oh, okay. Well, I appreciate the contribution there, but you should <laughs> hold off on that. <laughs> um, yeah, so you can see there's a big difference here between 150K in relative value versus 250K in absolute value. That's the main concept here. So the sales stages, you know, um, arrive at milestones in your sales process that are practical for you. You know, I offered you. Uh, what I consider to be fairly generic recommendations on Tuesday, suspects, prospects, opportunities, you know, the whole difference between leads and that how they sort of narrow down and those conversion metrics. Uh, think through your stages, arrive at uh, sales stages and milestones that are practical for you. Um, and the conversion metrics themselves, you have to be patient. It's going to be a year or more before they really help you inform your sales forecasts. They will never help. They're a very reliable method for sales forecasting, and they will never help you if you don't start capturing your conversion metrics uh, today, right? They're not going to help you today, though. You just have to collect the data. They're going to help you debug your sales process. They have to increase from left to right, and they're going to help you. They're going to become really valuable to inform your sales forecast later on. So get in the practice of capturing those conversion metrics. So I wanna go through the same uh, weighted uh, pipeline example in a variable priced offering against a calendar so you can answer the question about you know, cash flows. So again, same thing here, same stages, same weightings, and the variable, the potential value of the deal is variable depending upon other factors the size of your offering, the size of the company, whatever your revenue model is. 
In this case, I'm capturing the potential value of the deal, what stage they're at in my sales process, and the timing if it's known. And just with this information, I'm able to not only come up with the weighted value, the relative value, but I'm able to determine when that's likely to close over the next uh, four quarters. The reason I don't have any money going um, uh, is uh, prospective booking over the next four quarters for company F is I am unaware of their timing. Right, so if you don't know something, don't put it in your forecast. I would also recommend um, sometimes when you attempt to forecast revenue, um, and it depends upon the length of your sales cycle, of course, but for most longer term B2B sales cycles, i.e. eight, nine, 10 month cycles, I think you'll be better served to forecast your revenues quarter to quarter versus month to month. Because uh, otherwise, you'll find you're investing a lot of time constantly pushing uh, your forecast back month by month by month, and quarter just seems to be a, a little bit uh, more stable. So, there's a big difference between the absolute value and the relative value again here in the variable uh, price offering. So, a sales forecast is nothing more than the deal value um, factored by the stage of your sales process over the calendar. It's that simple. I would argue that um, if you get much more complex than this, then you're gonna get into diminishing returns on the value and how um, helpful a forecasting model actually is. All right, sales economics. Um, I think I shared this with you on Tuesday that sales is your most uh, expensive investment in terms of real and in terms of opportunity cost. And we all know that you can't manage what you don't measure. So when it comes to sales, uh, the term of the day is COCA or cost of customer acquisition. Uh, it, when, you, when you subtract your cost of co customer acquisition from your bookings, then you have your go-to-market margins, right? What's it cost? What money is left over after your fully burdened sales and marketing investment, right? To apply, to invest in different areas of your company. So your COCA is what matters. Um, the deeper a prospect, this is an important concept. Uh, the deeper a prospect gets into your sales process, um, by definition, the more expensive they become. So you need to know your COCA at each stage of the sales process to ID areas where you can improve. Uh, it's also very helpful uh, to uh, identify areas where you can scale. In other words, where you have a low uh, cost, uh, that tends to be very scalable. The reverse is also um, not true. Uh, you won't be able to scale things with a high cost of scale. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna walk you through um, a, a, a small case study here of a software development services company uh, that generates their leads 100% from SEO and PPC with uh, three full-time sales reps, All right? So, and forgive me on this slide, I'm about to break um, every PowerPoint rule known to man on this one. I'm gonna cram a lot of information on here, but. Hopefully it helps you understand sort of the larger picture here. So like any good company, uh, we got a couple of websites up here, not one, uh, so that we can do proper A to B testing on lead generation here, which is important when you're relying 100% on SEO and PPC. And I'm investing roughly $215,000 a year in, um, in uh, Google uh, ad campaigns and co-marketing. Uh, campaigns, and as a result, I'm generating over 100,000 visitors a year to my websites, split between the two sites, uh, website A and website B. Within the website, uh, we offer uh, people uh, lots of different ways that they can contact us, either through a request for information form, a live chat, or phone calls. 
And from this, uh, the investment of uh, $215,000 in those campaigns yielded 500 inbound inquiries or roughly two a day. They are prospects. We haven't talked with them yet. Um, of course, in addition to taking on new business, we, weren't, we don't know who these customers are, so we reach out to them and we talk to them. And one out of 10 of those prospects converts to an opportunity. So out of the 10 inbound inquiries we received, uh, uh, applying our own uh, company profile and buyer profile criteria, uh, we determined that one in 10 of those prospects were actually qualified to take our time. They were good qualified opportunities. Now, addition to those opportunities, we've already got existing clients and we're busy farming and growing those accounts. So between the hunting and the farming, we have a total of 81 opportunities that we're working uh, across the sales team. From those 81 opportunities, 75 proposals uh, went out the door resulting in just under 50 signed agreements, 22 with new clients and 27 from uh, is existing clients and a couple of duds, people that signed an agreement but just went away, which happens. Uh, the, the, the yield uh, for this in terms of bookings was just under $4 million, split roughly 50-50 between the current um, uh, annual period and the uh, forward-looking 12-month period. When you look at the conversion rates between these different stages, when you go from suspect to prospect, it's uh, minutia is what you might expect, but it's that 10% that went from prospects to opportunities and it increased again significantly to 60% between uh, opportunities uh, to customers, signed customers. We have a large number uh, on the conversion rate because we have a small number in uh, the folks that we let through our process and take up our time. So in other words, we were very selective in the folks that we let into our sales process. So four and a half percent of those 500 inquiries closed as new business, which uh, by comparison is, is pretty good. Um, and of course, a much higher percentage uh, closed in farming simply because the uh, confidence and the trust was already established. It was a logical next step in a project and we're already in their accounts payable system. So it was a lot easier to convert those than it was new, new customers onboarding. Now let's look at the COCA. Let's look at the cost of customer acquisition at each stage. Uh, each time somebody landed on our website, it cost us $1.75. Each time somebody reached out to us, the cost for that prospect was $430, which is the 500 div uh, divided by uh, the, our, our total spend divided by 500. When they reach the opportunity phase, we now have invested $4,200 uh, in each opportunity that we're actively working, and they're not a customer yet. And by the time those few that do convert to a customer, they cost us just under $10,000. So $10,000, just under $10,000 is our cost of customer acquisition for, for a client. So let's look at this in terms of it, the, the, just the sales economics, the numbers. From a total bookings of 3 million nine, our marketing spend on Google AdWord and remarketing campaigns was $215,000. The sales reps cost us 90K each with an 8% commission on the 1 million annual quota. So that's a total base of 360K and total commissions on performance at quota of 312 for a total sales spend of 672,000. Combined with the total marketing spend 
uh, a sales and marketing spend of $887,000. Divide 3 million nine by 887, our cost of customer acquisition is 23%. In other words, for every dollar this company invests in sales and marketing yields $3 in cash flow. Let's talk about some things worth measuring. The source, the cost, and the conversion from prospecting, uh, from, from lead to uh, prospecting, right? Your leads, which ones are working, which ones are not working, what do they cost you? The conversions between prospect opportunity and customers and the COCA, right? This is valuable to measure between new and existing customers. It's valuable to measure by individual sales rep so you can get some sense of what the expected level of performance is. And if you offer different products, also uh, valuable to measure at the product level. And you can even, you know, put this in uh, pivot tables and look at sales rep by individual project by new and existing customers, right? That's kind of the matrix that you want to measure here, right? But it's really any metric that's unique to your go-to-market model that helps you uh, measure sales efficiency, performance, and margin. So. The, the bottom line here is your ability to measure money in and money out at a detailed level and on a consistent basis is the number one skill for startups that survive. It's also the number one skills that investor looks for. If you can go to an investor and say, listen, for every dollar we put in go to market yields $3 in free cash flow, you're gonna have investors lined up with their checkbooks. All right, let's jump into another failed case study. That's it for uh, sales forecasting and sales economics. Uh, what I wanna do now is um, shift um, the discussion to sales facilitator methods that help you opt in or opt out prospects in your sales process. All right, uh, so another mini case study here, you get a phone call from the COO of a large pharma company, uh, she recommended, uh, she heard um, of your company through one of her colleagues. You have a nice 45 minute chat on the phone. And as a result of that, you both agree um, to meet in person. She said, she's very busy. I've got about an hour of my time. Um, and uh, you wanted to make best use of this. This is a very large company. It's right in your sweet spot of your company profile. So you come very, very well prepared. You're loaded for bear. When you show up, you've got information on your company. You've got your demo ready. You've got your ROI calculator, your competitive matrix, uh, your implementation uh, method. Um, you even leave behind two case studies and you know, great customer references. You, 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 know, you didn't leave any stone un, uh, unturned. The one hour meeting turns into three hours. It was the best sales meeting you ever had. And that's because you were so super well prepared and you covered all the bases. There wasn't anything you were unprepared uh, in response to the questions or requests that came from the prospective customer. You're pretty excited about it. Um, but for some reason, three weeks have now passed um, and despite numerous emails and phone calls, um, you're, you're getting ghosted. The, C, the COO has gone completely radio silent. Why did this prospect go from totally interested to totally unresponsive? And this is one of the big lessons that I learned in sales because, you know, when you get somebody's attention, and they're a great fit for what you do, and they start asking a bunch of questions, all you wanna do is just feed them everything that they need uh, to move the opportunity forward and to help position your company um, and um, earn their uh, business. And you're not very disciplined about that. 
And what I learned was that I covered all my bases. That was the problem. That was not an asset in this meeting. That was a problem. In sales parlance, I call this spilling all your candy in the lobby, right? Have the discipline not to provide, not to attempt to go from zero to close in a single meeting and cover all your bases. What's going on here is the COO, the reason she's not contacting you is she feels that she has everything she needs from you. She doesn't need any additional information. And likely she's using all that great information that you provided her as a baseline to compare you to others out there in the market. She doesn't have a reason to contact you any further. So the lesson here is that customers are built through trust and confidence that's established through a back and forth collaborative process, not by unloading all your information in the first meeting. So let's talk about those sales prospecting do's and don'ts. The Occam Razor principle applies here. Less material is more. Almost every one of your topics fits on a single page. Right? You can always make details available. Wait for people to ask for them. Don't provide the detail up front. It's likely to be confusing. Right? Share your material with people throughout the sales discussion piece by piece as appropriate as requested or needed to support the sales process. Don't just dump it on people. And use this metering out of the material is a means to pay attention to telltale signs of buying or stalling. Is the prospect, are they easy to get a hold of? Are they willing to trade you insights in exchange for the information you're providing them? What about the cadence and the momentum of the discussion? All right. Um, when you dump all your information on somebody, you have no way of measuring their interest or cadence. In fact, there is no cadence. It's all done. So if I can offer you a recipe for sales failure, it's having a meeting with somebody, giving them a bunch of information, scheduling another meeting, giving them the rest of your information and asking them for business. And what you're gonna get is a big question mark. To the contrary, the recipe for sales success is have a very focused meeting. For example, your, your initial meeting might be on a needs assessment and where you determine fit and you provide them a background on your company and you schedule another meeting and uh, you prov they requested how you stack up against other things they're considering. So you give them the deck and the competitive matrix and in, in exchange, uh, they give you some insight on how um, your solution is going to be valued inside the organization. In other words, the the economic impact of your solution. Similarly, you schedule another meeting where you go into the demo, you share some white papers, and in exchange, they provide you some insights on um, how large of an impact, uh, how much of the organization is impacted by this, not just the value, and so on and so forth, right? So instead of one meeting or two meeting, what I've done is I've stretched it out and I've I built, I've, I've left some room for building the relationship. And I've had very, very focused discussions. And because of that, I was able to request uh, very focused information insights in, in exchange. When you follow this process, the do together just becomes the logical next step of your discussion. It's not an ask, it's okay, this all looks good. Let's, you know, let's do this. So try to build a sales process where uh, you build intelligence and insights uh, with the customer and in exchange, they gain knowledge and trust and confidence in you and your team. If it turns out that you're marching somebody down this process and uh, they stop responding to you uh, at say the third meeting, well, guess what? They're not qualified to take your time. Um, you might want to understand why, but nonetheless, they're not moving forward and you just saved yourself a bunch of time of uh, 
additional meetings when they're not qualified. If they're unwilling to trade with you, they don't trust you, they're not qualified, right? A, a, a good buyer-seller relationship is the exchange of value in both directions, not just one direction. And if people are asking you for customer references throughout this entire process, you do not provide them. Um, and the reason is I like to use customer references is the very last step in my sales process. When they're looking at one of my proposals and where the customer references are much more impactful. Uh, you'll find that people will insist or ask for them early. My pat response is, hey, listen, um, my customers are very busy. Um, and uh, if it turns out that at some point in the future, you're serious about doing business with us, in other words, you know, you're evaluating a, a proposal, we will be more than happy to share references with you. But until that point, I really want to protect uh, my clients from um, a lot of prospects of uh, prospective customers taking up their valuable time. I hope you appreciate that. That's how we will treat you if you become one of our clients. When you explain it like that, 98% of the time people will respect that and back off. So exercise sales discipline. Prospects, because they have their own agenda, will often take shortcuts. In sales, you just simply do not have that luxury. Do not let prospects dictate your behavior. This doesn't sound very intuitive, um, but it's actually one of the things I'm hopeful that you walk away from uh, over these last two sessions is the concept that by um, segmenting and slowing down your sales process, you will actually speed up sales. It sounds counterintuitive, but it's true. And you do this by sharing your tools and your value wisely and using them to gauge the level of interest in whether a prospect is a good use of your time. You can never um, do that if you don't keep your powder dry, right? You really have to meet the value out over a longer period of time and give yourself room to build a relationship where doing business is just the logical next step in a sales conversation. Prospective customers value lots of things, right? Capabilities and implementation support, underlying science, technology, the business case, whatever. Team sales is your opportunity to show the breadth of your team the individual strengths of people on your team, and actually how you work and how you coordinate as a team. So team sales is your opportunity as a founder to work smarter, not harder. So let me give you a recipe for repeatable sales success with the facilitator here, right? You have these various meetings, right? The operational buyer, compliance, technical, financial buyer, and you align those conversations with the subject, the appropriate subject matter experts on your team. Operational buyer connecting with your PM, compliance with your legal, technical with your CTO, financial with your CFO, right? That's your job in sales is to align those conversations, right? And offering people off ramps, right? Any one of these people can veto your deal based upon their own uh, perspective here. Um, so the facilitator is proactively offering people the opportunity to continue or exit the sales process. In other words, forcing people to make a decision to opt in or opt out, right? But not leaving it up to guesswork. That's the big difference here. And again, the do becomes just connecting the executive buyer uh, with you or your founder and CEO uh, to, um, to close the business. You're never going to be able to do this in sales until you get comfortable and get good at getting beyond the one-on-one -on -one conversation with people. Too often I see salespeople having a one-on-one -on -one conversation and moving it forward in the sales funnel without widening the conversation. And I would argue that, uh, 
even a well-qualified opportunity is not qualified anymore uh, if the contact in the account is not willing to widen the conversation. So what does that mean? It means connecting people with your team with people on their team. You do that by uh, making a, a simple request, a simple statement. Listen, our standard practice is to confirm the fit with the right people in your organization. You know, who do you recommend we connect with, you know, our team with, and how do you and I work together to coordinate that, right? You're not asking people for permission here, right? Um, you're, you're asking people, how do you go about doing this? Not whether doing this is a good idea, right? Most salespeople really struggle with how to expand the conversation within an organization. Offer, you know, and to help move this along, offer to bring your experts to the table. Uh, and they might in turn bring one of their more technical colleagues. Or if you're not the CEO, often to bring your CEO or founder into the conversation, which will encourage them to bring in their boss. Now, if the opportunity is truly qualified, they should not only be agreeable, they should be enthusiastic about engaging others uh, in their organization in the conversation, right? Because the sales decisions are made by teams, not individuals, right? So you want to start pulling in the decision-making unit. You want to start forming that. If, however, your contact is resistant or circumspect about uh, involving other people, they're not qualified. You're not talking to the right person uh, or they've got an alternative agenda, right? Something's wrong here, right? Um, uh, when people start introducing you to other people on their team, that means they're willing to expend some of their political capital inside their organization. The reverse is also true. Somebody's not willing to take any risk. Uh, they've got another agenda in mind, or you're talking to the wrong person, or something else is wrong. You need to find out, but uh, it's not a qualified uh, opportunity. Once the conversation is expanded beyond your initial contact, it becomes much easier for you to reach out with each person in their organization independently. Never ever reach over somebody's head without permission. Right, I was I was talking with the founder, and this must have been 10 years ago, but I remember it like it was yesterday. And uh, he thought he was being so smart that he learned their email construct from one of their engineers, and he went to their management page and just started um, ambushing their management team by applying their name to their email construct right over the head of the person he was talking with. And guess where that went? Well, nowhere very fast. Never ever reach over to somebody's head without their permission. Just request an email introduction and always CC uh, people that you're in discussions with as a courtesy. In sales, get beyond the one-on-one -on -one conversation. I can't emphasize how important this is. Always attempt to connect people on your team with people on their team. The more people that on the prospects team that you engage with people on your team, the higher the probability of winning a new paying customer. That's a fact, that's a sales fact. So get in the habit of getting comfortable and um, developing methods to get beyond the one-on-one -on -one conversation. Remember with every interaction you have with the prospective customer, have a plan in place to help them and add value. And every time you give something to a prospect, ask for something in return. It's a soft ask. What you're doing is you're getting people um, in the habit of making these trades. This is not just a one-way street. You've got to break people of the traditional uh, buyer gets everything they want. You know, there's the old uh, golden rule uh, in sales for buyers, and that is whoever has the gold makes the rules, right? Forget about that, right? Get people into a collegial relationship where they generally are interested in helping you help them. And they do that by sharing insights. And interpret the timing and the quality of their response is a primary indicator of whether they're qualified to take your time. 
it turns out that prospective customers who hang in with your process, you're in a good position and you've earned the right to ask for their business. Okay, now I wanna talk a little bit more about qualifying and disqualifying, and we've only got a few minutes left, so I wanna cover this material here. I think I started our session on Tuesday by sharing with you my philosophy about sales being that it's, um, it's, it's the opposite of what you read in a book, where the books tell you it's all about qualifying customers, and uh, in, in, my, in my experience, qualified, Buyers are easy to spot. It's it's uncovering the well, ones that appear to be qualified but are not that are a waste of your time that you really have to get good at. So I believe that sales is not about qualifying prospective customers. And let me explain to you why. Uh, let's pretend that over here on the left here, uh, these are the 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 uh, lead the 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 prospects that 10% that surfaced from those 500 leads, those suspects, right? 90% of them were uh, not qualified where you've got this 10% being uh, qualified as prospects. Let's unpack that 10%. Well, that consists of um, on either end, a yes or a no. And in between a yes but, a no but, or an unknown. Most of them are unknown. You just don't know right? Um, it's the exception, but sometimes it happens that you get to a yes or no quickly, but oftentimes when you're developing opportunities, it merges into, uh, you know, moving more toward a yes with a but or concerns or more toward a no with a but with concerns, right? Uncontested yeses and nos, those are easy, right? They go to contract or they exit your process. You get a yes, but um, sometimes it's possible to negotiate uh, to a yes by making a concession. And even a no, but sometimes it's possible to convert to a yes, but it's not a concession. It's a huge contortion, usually. It's this middle ground here that is often um, a huge waste of time for salespeople and where you have to get really, really good at fleshing people out of this what I call the slow no zone, right? It's a, it's a no, it's just a slow no, and it's taking up your time, your valuable time. In sales, you wanna spend your time up here, not down here. So you've basically got two options. You can work 18 hour days, right? Flushing those slow no's out, and of course you'll need a therapist. Um, or you can get good at proactively disqualifying prospects. And that's what I wanna to talk to you about next, is how do you get good at uh, proactively disqualifying prospects? So sales is not about qualifying prospective customers. It's about disqualifying prospects with the appearance of real that'll waste your time. So organizations tend to buy when the following conditions exist. There's recognition of an unsolved problem or need that's a top priority for the organization where the pain, cost, and risk is clear and quantifiable and a well-respected advocate inside that organization owns the initiative. When these conditions exist, this organization is gonna buy from somebody and there is a budget available. When you combine, combine these conditions with the perception that you're offering is the best alternative and they have confidence in your team and company and a trusted relationship with the sales rep, then the budget's available for you. And there's lots of proxies for no when just one of these uh, uh, criteria is not firmly established. It turns out that salespeople, uh, you'll learn through your career that people that you work with have 25 different ways of saying no. Um, when I cover salespeople in my, um, in my normal curriculum, which we skipped here, one of the myths uh, with salespeople is that uh, salespeople are liars. They'll tell you anything you want to get a deal. And um, the lesson that I've learned there is salespeople are not liars. Buyers are the liars. They're the people that will um, misdirect, uh, misguide, lie, whatever for their own um, 
uh, agendas, ambitions. It's the buyers that are uh, far less forthright with people than salespeople. So, you know, you're on the phone with somebody, for example, you know, I'm not sure you ask people, you're trying to expand the conversation. I'm not sure who the right person is for you to speak with. You know, you get something like that from the from somebody on the phone, interpret them as saying, how about no one, right? This person's not qualified. Or somebody starts a response to a question with the word management has decided to blah, blah, blah. Whenever anyone starts a sentence with the word management, guess what that means? It means, one, they're not management, and they probably have no idea what management's even thinking. You're not talking to the right person. Um, I'm sure none of you have heard this one before. It's not in this year's budget. When people tell you that, it's just a low priority. It's a proxy for low priority. Um, I don't know if uh, you've heard this too often. This is a pretty common reply. We would like to partner with you. Um, that's a proxy for, uh, I don't have any access to money. Or, um, Somebody starts out, you've had a conversation going with somebody, maybe it's your third or fourth meeting, and just out of the blue, an unsolicited compliment comes out of your contact. I really love, you know, we really like this. We love you guys, right? It just, um, you know, uh, you just wait for the butt here, right? What this person, um, is doing is um, overcompensating, right? Um, they're, they're, they're deciding to go in another direction or for whatever reason, they're not gonna be moving forward with you. Uh, this person won't buy from you, but they want you to like them, right? So they, they're gonna give you a compliment, um, you know, uh, to offset the bad news here, all right? So whenever you get a completely unsolicited compliment in sales, you, you know, you pretty much um, know you're screwed. Uh, so that's another sort of telltale sign uh, or a different proxy for no. So these are just examples, and I lay these out there just as examples. I don't expect you to remember them. As a matter of fact, I don't even expect you to uh, apply these because they're very, very difficult to discern. So I'm going to give you some techniques here that make these much more obvious and actionable. By the way, the most common proxy for no in sales is getting ghosted, right? People are just rude and they just will not follow up. So in sales, no is your always your second best answer and the slow no is always your worst answer. So in sales, if you do not take ownership of the word no, prepare to spend most of your time working deals that go nowhere. So no is elusive, right? Buying signals, easy to spot. Stalling signals, often ambiguous. The vast majority of your sales efforts should result in no thank you, especially early in your sales process. But for alternative agendas, they do not, right? And the reason is it doesn't come easily for most people, right? They want to avoid conflict, right? Or they've been talking with you a while and they have to move away and they're a little embarrassed, right? Uh, because they are going to take a change in direction, or they've been taught at a very young age that it's not um, actually uh, encouraged to say no, or maybe it's just the rude buyer attitude, or uh, more commonly in my experience, it's an ulterior motive, right? You're training them for free, you're um, giving them knowledge that they need to build something with somebody else or internally, or you just got somebody that's looking to um, upskill themselves and learn because they happen to have time in their schedule. So it's the prospects themselves that will, will misdirect, lie, delay, ghost when they turn you down, and they're gonna make up any reason. And unfortunately, a simple no is rarely one of them. Uh, now, I've had the privilege of, of presenting um, my, uh, my, my sales training and my lectures um, in 26 countries over the past um, 10 years. And I can tell you that the saying no problem, it transcends gender, national, and ethnic borders. It's everywhere, right? It's not just um, 
exclusive to the, the U.S. culture. And uh, two years ago in my travels, I think I finally discovered the origin of the saying no problem. Does anyone want to guess on chat what country is the source of the saying no problem? This should be fun. Anyone have any ideas? What country is the source of the saying no problem? India, nope. UK, nope. China, Canada, bingo. Gory, you nailed it, Canada. Exactly, no, Japan is not, J Japan is the, the yes problem. Yes means no. In Canada, they're just too nice, right? Um, they're the nicest people on the planet you ever want to meet and they will never ever say no. So I believe that that is the origin of the saying no problem. Um, I presented this to um, 100 founders up in Halifax three years ago. Uh, no, it wasn't three years ago, it was maybe a year and a half ago. And um, I shared with them that I, I thought that they were the source of the saying no problem. And um, somebody in the crowd raised their hand and I called on them and they said, um, I'm sorry, I apologize for that. <laughs> Which just goes to show you how nice they are. So um, understand that the no is always going to be elusive here, right? And one of the biggest challenges in sales is uncovering the slow no graciously and efficiently so you can invest your time more productively elsewhere, right? So most of, our, most of us are not clairvoyant. You're not gonna pick up on those super subtle signals, right? Because it's not, those are not easy to discern. So I'll give you a couple of suggestions here. One, early on in the sales process, ask for no. Just ask for it. Say, listen, I'm just going to take up three minutes of your time. I think we can really help you guys based upon what my understanding is about your company and your needs. Uh, give me two minutes of your time and please say no at the end. If you don't think it's a good fit or whatever, just please say no. Ask for it. And what you're going to find when you give people permission to say no, they'll go ahead and say it. Unless they're being real evil in their attention, where if they don't say no, they're either qualified to move forward or they're being um, quite evil in their intention in uh, wasting their time. So early on, while you're qualifying prospects, ask for no. Later on in your sales process, what you do is you say no for people, right? I call this off-ramping, right? And what off-ramping does, it's a way of purging slow no's from your sales funnel in a, a clear and elegant way to pr uh, provoke uh, buying and stalling signals. So off-ramping is a sales technique for purging slow nose from your pipeline by proactively offering prospects the ability to opt in or opt out of your sales process, i.e. take the off-ramp. This is the primary skill of the sales facilitator. What are off-ramps? They're non-threatening questions, tests, or challenges that provide insight into things that you need to know about the account. What are their priorities? What are they predisposed to? How are they gonna return on their investment here? What's the size of the impact, right? What are they objecting to? Who are you up against? What is their decision-making process? You can discover a lot of this information by uh, in off-ramping ways that if they don't give you the right answer, you know that they're not qualified to take up your time. So off-ramps are thoughtful probing questions that provoke clear buying and stalling signals that are observable and actionable by you. And they help prospects either self-qualify or disengage. So I'll give you a couple of examples here. Um, you know, you have trouble getting a hold of somebody, you finally get them on the phone, uh, and you say, listen, Tom, um, I've had trouble. You know, we seem to slow things down the last couple of months. Sounds like you got a lot in your plate right now. Maybe we should just pick up our discussion in a month or two. That's a very considerate thing to offer somebody in sales, right? And the off-ramp here might be, hey, you know what? You're probably right. Thank you very much. Let's touch base in a couple of months. To the contrary, the buying signal is, hey, no way, we're dying here. Sorry, I've been um, 
I've been, um, you know, heads down um, on closing the quarter business here. I apologize for not uh, staying in touch with you, uh, but we really need to pick up our conversation and, and move it forward here. Um, I often like to preempt people in their alternatives. So um, I ask people early in the sales process or as we start to get into it, have you considered X or Y or X or Y are competitors or alternatives to me? And what does that do when you do that? Well, one is um, when you do that, you get some real good insights on how far people are along in their sales process, but also implied here by asking this is your confidence in um, outperforming X and Y. So the off-ramp response uh, to that question is those options hadn't occurred to us. Well, um, you know that if they are serious about buying, um, they would have considered those options as part of their due diligence. So either they're not qualified or they're very, very early in the sales process. Conversely, the buying signal here is, you know, absolutely. They're both non-starters, here's why. And now you get to really understand how you stack up and why they're, what your, what your differentiated uh, value is. Uh, when you're trying to understand a little bit more about the, the impact and the cost and the ROI, you can tell somebody you really understand their pain, but what's the real cost behind that, right? Now, if they haven't measured the financial impact of that, um, it's either a stalling or an off-ramp here. Is it, People are going to buy something, they're going to want to kind of justify it, um, you know, in dollars and cents, right? Uh, conversely, they can say, listen, we understand this pain. It's costing our company approximately X dollars every year, right? That's a clear uh, buying signal, right? By asking a simple, open-ended, non-threatening question. You want to you figure out whether your solution uh, um, the size of the problem you're solving um, is compatible with your pricing. You just ask people, you know, how many people in your team are impacted, right? They could say, well, we just started to focus on this issue, or you know what, everyone in the company knows this is a real problem. Lastly, I'll give you one last example. You get off a phone call uh, with somebody maybe on uh, you know the west coast somebody senior in management it was a brutal phone call um, the senior manager uh, had a very antagonistic uh, attitude toward your company and your your offering uh, the call didn't go well so you call up your your uh, ally in the organization your champion uh, you just geez you know what he certainly took a different view um, what do you have any suggestions? Well, you know what? Uh, unfortunately, he rarely changes his mind or the buying signal. Well, the reason he was like that is he got burned on this before and I've got some thoughts on how we can get him on board. Lastly, if you're selling people efficiency, try to understand um, whether the, uh, you're selling efficiency to the person whose product you're, uh, you displace right? That's a very important thing in terms of understanding what level of organization you sell into. You know, you can ask them a simple open-ended question. Isn't management just going to tell your team to suck it up, right? You're, you're turning the crank 350 times a day. Isn't that your job? Well, it's a distinct possibility, or you know what? Management already told us and recognizes there's much more, there's much smarter things we can be doing with our time, and they we have their full support on this. So sales off-ramping, when people have the appearance of being qualified, but they're really not, what it does is it provides a fast, frictionless exit from your sales process. On the contrary, when you offer uh, somebody who is genuinely qualified an off-ramp, what it does is it serves to strengthen their resolve it earns their trust and it provides you valuable insights in how to win the business. The best measure of effective off-ramping is um, when a well-qualified prospect takes an off-ramp and resurfaces 18 months later 
I'd like to tell you a quick story about this and anecdote, but I don't have time. I, I just want to close with a couple of uh, different um, points I want to make here because we're running short on time. So offering prospects off ramps, what it does is it builds confidence and trust in you by not driving to a yes. You're not coming off as a salesperson. You're offering people, you're asking people probing logical questions that determine fit and help people in their own mind um, opt in or opt out of your process and you're not coming across as a salesperson, but you're building trust by asking questions that uh, confirm that you have their best interest in mind. It turns out that people who have sold themselves with your assistance, of course, become much stronger advocates of a purchasing decision. So effective enterprise sales is not measured by the statements or claims that you make, but by the thoughtful probing questions you ask, your willingness and your confidence to enable people to opt in or opt out of your process. Of course, your competence here, your competencies, your special insights and knowledge to solve their needs and how you help them overcome legitimate concerns and objections. Remember, um, uh, I mentioned uh, early day one that the MID, MIT definition of early stage sales, sales is um, debugging people's objections to spending money. Well, that's what it is until the only objection that remains is price. If people object over price, congratulations, you're probably getting close to a deal. It's not often that people object over price unless all their other objections have been satisfied. So over the past couple of days, um, I've covered what you probably consider to be a lot of material. There's a lot more. I just outlined here some of the things that I've covered, I, I picked, that I thought might be uh, helpful for you. Um, here, there's lots more to be learned in sales. I'm still learning. Um, I offer uh, training and coaching to organizations, um, uh, both um, on-premise and uh, in Zoom formats here, um, one day to one week formats, both for, uh, for startups and scale-ups. And two years ago, started offering remote uh, sales coaching uh, sessions to founders and their go-to-market teams uh, via Zoom through uh, monthly pre-scheduled 90-minute sessions. I'm always busy, but hey, I'm always interested in learning about new opportunities with programs or companies. If you're aware of an organization um, or company that can benefit from my work, uh, please uh, reach out to me uh, to discuss. I uh, very much appreciate it. It's my hope that uh, over the past couple of, of sessions, You've, um, you've learned one or two things that um, help you improve sales performance uh, and accelerate growth of your company. Happy hunting. Uh, I've got a couple of minutes here, maybe five minutes for some Q&A if anyone has any uh, questions. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ken. That was really amazing. Uh, so, so much knowledge and it was like um, very, very practical, very, very insightful. So I'm sure a lot of us will be reaching out to you uh, individually. Uh, in the last uh, just four minutes we have with you here, there's a couple of questions in the chat. Maybe the first one from John Stock, um, the best techniques or tips for cold email call or LinkedIn messages for cold outreach. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll harken back to the, to the Occam's razor principle, right? Um, be brief, mm -hmm. right? Um, I can tell you this, I get bombed all the time in um, LinkedIn, in email, and anything beyond two sentences, I won't even read it. I don't have the time, it's not qualified to take my time. But if you can get somebody's attention, right, in a sentence and just say, you know, click here to connect or let me know if you wanna connect, right? Be kind of informal, but be very, very brief. I find those to be much more impactful versus people that'll write really three or four paragraphs i mean do you really expect people to read three or four paragraphs in a in a in an in mail and in linkedin or email probably not so um 
I would encourage you to, to also uh, talk with marketing experts, direct marketing experts. They have a great deal of expertise on this, but that's my, my own two, cent, two cents on that topic. Great. And Brian uh, wasn't on the session on Tuesday. He's asking if there's any couple sales tools or uh, resources that you could recommend. Is there a podcast that you listen to or, or some resource? Like you know, that? I'm the worst guy uh, to ask that question because you know what? I don't, I don't watch podcasts and I don't read sales books. I don't do any of that uh, stuff. I learn through my own mistakes <laughs> mostly mm -hmm. uh, and just working with companies in practice. Um, I wish I could point you um, in a couple of uh, resources. Um, actually, coincidentally, one of the books that um, I read uh, recently uh, that I thought was really insightful here. So um, it's a book called Mindset. And um, what, what Carol Dweck does really is reinforce the value of storytelling in sales. Um, anecdotes and storytelling. Mm -hmm. uh, it turns out that uh, people make uh, buying decisions more based on emotion and instinct, and they justify it with logic. So if you start with ROI uh, and expect people to make a purchasing decision, you're going at it backwards, right? So start by appealing to people's emotions and instinct. And the best way you do that is you tell short stories. And what Carol does is give you a really nice outline for stories here and turn in, in rules of thumb in terms of relevance and brevity and all those kinds of things to be able to build sort of a repertoire of stories that you can share with people. Because at the end of the day, sales comes down to, um, you know, everyone has the same question in sales. And that is, have you solved a similar problem for somebody just like me? And when can we talk with them? Mm -hmm. right? And you don't want to share those references with people right away. So what you have to do is be able to share those stories with people, either anecdotally or through case studies, and get really good at that. And this book is, a, I think, provides some really valuable insights into that. So hopefully that, that's helpful. Great. Thank you so much, Kent. And if anyone wants to reach you for the consulting, LinkedIn is the best way uh, to, to contact you. Yeah, LinkedIn. Or, uh, you know, uh, you, I, I gave you my uh, email address there, I believe. Uh, let me... Yeah, uh, it's, it's on your... Um, on your uh, yep, that's my option. email address. Yeah. You can uh, connect with me any way you want. Great. Uh, Joe, Regina, thank you very much for thank inviting you, me. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity. Um, and um, happy hunting, everybody.